Good morning, can you hear me well? So good, good morning to, to everyone, it's a great pleasure to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. Um, I will talk about the Fed and C ECB bank terrorism compared. So I will compare the Fed and the ECB. Are there differences and are they important? And also indicate how this may be important for the future. Um, as we all have already have seen in uh, Professor Hoppe's speech, um, the main purpose of, or one main purpose of central banks is to finance governments on cost of uh, the general population that loses uh, in purchasing power. So the ECB and the Fed use slightly different ways to finance governments and also in different quantities, which is resultant of their different slightly different philosophies. First of all, what are the similarities? Well, both are the owners of the printing press and produce base money, or the monetary base, and on this monetary base, the fractional reserve banking system expands uh, the credit structure, creates fiduciary media. So cash and central bank reserves are produced by the central bank, and then the banking system erects upon, uh, on top of it, the credit structure. So the ways are slightly different. Let's first look on the Fed. Uh, the Fed uses what it calls open market operations to manipulate the interest rates, the federal funds target rate. Eh? And they always emphasize, put the emphasis on the interest rate. We will raise or lower the interest rate. And not on the way they are doing it by, very, by changing uh, the uh, the increase in the money supply. So they divert attention from money production to the interest rate. And there are two main ways the, the Fed does it. Uh, the first one is produce money and lend or loan out. Mm. So they produce money and then they lend it to banks. This can be done by repurchase agreements. In repurchase agreements, the Fed buys a loan from a bank and then sells it back later at a higher price and the difference is then the interest rate. Um, similar is collateralized lending. There, the, the Fed gives a, a loan to a bank, and the bank has to provide a collateral, a guarantee to, to the Fed. And those are, of course, short term. And the other way that the Fed uh, uses more intensely is uh, produce money and buy. So they produce money and buy government bonds. And of course, there is no, no term involved in it. So these are the operations that the Fed uses to manipulate the interest rate, and then there's also the discount window, which has another purpose. The purpose is to help out banks with short-term liquidity problems. Their initiative is on part of the banks that approach this, the Fed and ask for overnight an overnight loan at a penalty rate. So this is basically how the Fed operates, and the ECB, has also open market operations. They have, they have also the produce money and buy bonds program, but they don't usually use it or didn't use it. And most importantly, they use the produce money and lend uh, program with repurchase agreements. There they have different facilities, have different programs with different uh, maturities, the long term refinancing facilities, the main refinancing facilities, the structural refinancing facilities, the financing facility. It, it reminds one very much of social engineering, all these different kinds of facilities. And the standing facilities are similar to the uh, facility of the Fed, the discount window. There's a marginal lending and the deposit facility where banks can, marginal, can lend overnight or deposit money overnight at the ECB. Mm -hmm. So you see it's basically the same, different names. Uh, just different names for the same thing. The main difference is that the Fed concentrates to manipulate, manipulate the money supply on produce money and buy, buy government bonds, and the ECB produce money and lend. That's the main difference. How does it look, this, this difference on the balance sheet? Mm, it's a balance sheet, a simplified balance sheet of the Federal Reserve. 
Uh, we have here on the asset side uh, government bonds, gold, foreign exchange reserves, on, on the liability side, monetary base, bank notes, and reserves that banks hold at the Fed. So, what do they do to increase uh, the money supply? They buy government bonds from banks. Then happens this uh, they buy $50 government bonds, and bank reserves increase. 50 and thereby the, the base money, the, 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 uh, the, uh, the bottom part of the inverted pyramid, uh, increases $50. The ECB, there's a simplified balance sheet of the ECB. On the other side, the loans to banks, gold, foreign exchange are the same, and notes and bank reserves. How does the ECB increase the monetary base? Well, it gives more loans. It produces money and lends out, loans out. Uh, so the loans increase. So you see, this is a main operational difference. So now I want to explain how the banking system erects on top of this increase in base money, this inverted pyramid of, of credits. This is a balance sheet of a commercial bank that has a reserve ratio of 10%, deposits 100 and cash uh, the reserve 10. Has a capital 100, loans uh, uh, 90, government bonds 100. The ECB now increases the money supply. It gives a loan to the bank. It's on the liability side, loan from the central bank 100. And on the other side, the bank has now new reserves. So now the bank has 110 in reserves and 100 in deposits, so it has free reserves, it can give more loans. Alternative, alternatively, uh, one thing important here is also that the loan from the central bank requires the collateral. Uh, and the collateral in this case will be, of course, the government bonds. In the Fed way, the bank sells the government bonds directly to the Fed and receives new reserves. Uh, and the same thing happens, that cash and reserves are 110 and deposits 100, so we have free reserves. Now let's look how this multiplies. Uh, bank A, there in the upper left corner, there we have the new reserves of 100 and with the loan of the central bank, and now the bank has three reserves of 100 and 90% it lends, it loans out to customer Y and puts it on, a, on his bank account. So the deposit of customer <coughs> Y is 90. Of course Y asked for the loan for some purpose, so he will use the money. For example, he pays Z. He withdraws his money, you see it on the, on the right, bank A, the deposit disappears and the reserves are reduced. The bank A has now a reserve ratio of 10%. So why pay set this 90 monetary unions and set deposits the 90 monetary unions in units in his bank, bank B? So we see there that the 90 reserves of 90 monetary unions enter in bank B and set gets a deposit of 90. So now Bank B has three reserves and 90% of it, it will lend out 81 monetary units. It loans it to X and puts it uh, on his bank account 81. And X uses the money to pay V, withdraws the money. So there's a Bank B, the money is withdrawn, the deposit to X disappears and reserves are reduced by 81, and reserves 9. And X uh, and V deposits the money in his bank and Bank C and Bank C in, ter in turn also can give a loan of 90% to U of 72.9 monetary units and so on and so on. Uh, you see that from the initial 100 res new reserves resulting from the loan from the central bank we get finally 1,000 new deposits. So the, mo the money supply has increased with this 10% reserve ratio uh, 
1,000 monetary units. So you, you see the impact that the increase in base money initially by the central bank of 100 has on, on the money supply. This is the inverted pyramid from the beginning. So, now, who's the main beneficiary of this whole, whole process? Who gets the new money first? Well, hop, uh, well the banks receive the new reserves first and can then produce the usual intermediary, but also the government, of course, benefits because the, the banks buy government bonds. Why do they buy the government bonds? Because the Fed buys them directly and the ECB accepts, accepts them as preferred collateral. So, the government can use the system to finance its expenditures. Let's assume that the government, as often occurs, spends more than it receives in taxes. For the differences, it prints just government bonds. The banking system, and that's the case of the ECB, is willing to buy these bonds because the banking system knows that the ECB, against this collateral, is willing to give them new loans, new reserves. So, it provides the bonds as collateral to the ECB, and the ECB gives new reserves to the banking system, and then starts the process that we have seen before, the, the bank multiplier. But one, one thing is missing here, the, the interest. The government has to pay interest on, his bo on their bonds, to the banking system that is the legal owner of the bonds and the banking system has to pay interest on the loans it receives from the ECB and the ECB returns uh, the profits to the governments at the end of the year. So it's not really a deficit that hurts very much because you just print paper bonds or you don't even print them, you just uh, create them electronically. The interests and to a great measure flow back to you, and when the bonds, bonds come due, you print new bonds to substitute the old ones. So from this, uh, you can imagine that banks hold much government debts. In fact, they hold two trillion euros of government bonds in the EU. And this is 30% or almost 30% of all uh, of all euro era debts are held in banks. In comparison to the US, it's only 11%, and this can be explained easily with what we said before, that in the US, the Fed tends to buy the government bonds, and the government bonds are on the balance sheet of the Fed, while in the euro area, the banks just buy the government bonds and pledge them as collateral to receive the loans. So the Fed way is slightly different. We have again that the government spends more than it receives in taxes. Issues bonds for the difference, gets money from the banking system, and the banking system now sells the bonds, or the Fed purchases them in open market operations in exchange for reserves. And now the Fed is the legal owner of the bonds, so the government has to pay the interest to the Fed. The Fed remits um, the maturity back in form of profits. So again, a very nice way to finance, finance your, your expenditures. Economically, it's very similar. This uh, produce money and land and produce money and, uh, and buy or purchase. In both cases, the base money supply increases. In the case of CCB, the base money supply increases until the loan is not rolled over, not renewed. At the end of the new loan, all will be re reversed if it's not renewed. And in the case of the Fed, it's the same. The money supply increases until the bond is sold. If the Fed would sell uh, the bond back to the uh, banking system, it would drain reserves. 
So the difference is more legally that in the European Monetary Union the bonds remain the property of the banks. So the government bonds are off the balance sheet of the central bank. They are on the balance sheet of, uh, of, of banks. Eh? As we have seen, 30% of government bonds are held by banks. But in both cases, the government bonds are effectively monetized. So, uh, therefore, Greece was not the first time bailed out in, uh, in May 2010 or when, when the ECB started to buy government bonds, but all the time when the ECB started uh, from the very beginning to accept government bonds as collateral because it amounts to the same thing. And of course, uh, the ECB continues to accept uh, Greek bonds as collateral, even though they accept, accepted, uh, even though they are rated as junk by the rating agencies. The same happens with the Irish debt. So now, this is of course only part of how the, of part of the monetization of the government uh, deficit. There's another part which is more hidden. You have seen that government bonds are preferred collateral by the ECB or the Fed buys government bonds. That makes government bonds very liquid. Almost, it's almost as good as money because you, if you have, if you are a bank and you have government bonds, it's very easy to get new base money, new reserves. So that's a very liquid market and this leads to a second indirect monetization of the government debt. So again, the same, th the same thing, the government issues bonds, get, uh, sells it to the banking system. In case of the ECB, mm, bonds are pledged as, reserve, uh, as collateral and the banking system receives new reserves. Then happens what we saw before the credit expansion. Huh? The fractional reserve banking system increases the money supply. In our example, it, it's uh, multiplied the initial increase 10 times. Uh, it gives loans to entrepreneurs who then uh, pay the factors of production, or the owners of the factors of production, workers and so on. And the workers, some of the money they invest in, 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 in hedge funds and pension funds and for their insurances, and the insurances by also government bonds to a great extent. Why? Because they are so liquid. Rating aid, and there's also regulation that, uh, that pushes this, uh, basic two and, and three, that regards government bonds as a less risky, <coughs> risky asset. So you see that indirectly, not only is it direct by the banking system buying, uh, buying the government bonds, but also indirectly that the banking system creates new money, and this new money ends up, but due to the privileges of government bonds, uh, buying these bonds, uh, indirectly monetizes the government deficit. So, the, in, we saw in the euro area, 30% are held by, by banks, and a huge percentage also by this uh, invest, investment devices. And of course, also another source, source that holds government bonds are other central banks. You produce money and buy uh, foreign, foreign government bonds. And the, the most paradigmatic cases are, of course, China and Japan that hold US government bonds. So this is the way to finance your deficit, to monetize it. So now, the question is, who's the bigger bank, Fed or the ECB? So the methods are slightly different operationally, but economically it amounts to the same. But who's really the, the most dangerous criminal? We, could, we can look at it uh, indirectly by looking at how high is the deficit that is monetized directly and indirectly. Uh, and here we see that the US government deficit is higher than the euro area deficit for the uh, German one, mm -hmm. substantially higher. So this would indicate that the bigger bankster behind this deficit is the Fed. Mm -hmm. 
We can also look more directly on the balance sheet of the Fed, which represents space money. We see this is from 2007 to, to, to today, um, a few days ago. And there we see that yeah, the Fed's increased base power almost quadrupled, more than quadrupled the, its balance sheet from 800 billion to 2.7 trillion. In comparison, the ECB's balance sheet is has been expanded less. It has not not doubled from 1.2 trillion to 1.9. The direct monetization of uh, by produce money and buy government bonds, we see, and this is quantitative easing one and two, uh, we see that US treasuries have increased from, uh, yeah, from, from its low one trillion, one trillion dollars. Comparison to the ECB is only it's one tenth, or a little bit more than one tenth, it's 130. 38 billion. Of course, this is always also explainable through the different oper oper uh, uh, operations. As I, as I said, the Fed, to increase, to increase the money supply, they buy treasuries. Therefore, the treasuries increase so much on the ECB, on the, on the Fed's balance sheet. While the ECB doesn't do it uh, normally, they only started in, really in May 2010 with the Greek bailout, that what they do is they produce money and lend it against collateral. So this is not so surprising that the ECB is so much lower. So let's look at the different philosophy. The Fed indeed has an inherently slightly more inflationistic, inflationary philosophy because its mandate is has two mandates to maintain price stability, which is of course not defined as zero, increases of their manipulated statistics, but of higher to have a buffer against deflation. So they have this uh, unquote uh, price stability and full employment. So this, uh, even from their theoretical perspective, these goals can be in conflict and so you might, they might redu reduce interest rates, increase the money supply in order to what they think or in, to produce mm, or reduce unemployment. While the ECB has only uh, one mandate that is price stability and only if price stability is achieved then the ECB can help with other policies of the EU. And then the institutional setup or the institutional history also plays an important role. Ben Bernanke, the, mm -hmm. the president of the Fed, uh, is, most of his scholarly work is on the Great Depression. And his main point or his main finding is that the Great Depression was so great, so horrible because the Fed didn't, didn't produce enough money. So you could could have expected what he did after the collapse of Lehman Brothers and you can expect what he will do in, in the future. So this is the mindset of Ben Bernanke. Whether the ECB, which is more in the tradition of the Deutsche Bundesbank, that is, was one of the less inflationary central banks uh, in the world. Of course, now you might be surprised because in my book, The Tragedy of Theory, I, I write that the ECB was, if, was essentially installed to get rid of the discipline of the Bundesbank, to eliminate the Bundesbank. Yes, that's true, but you cannot do it immediately. You have to be, do, it, do it very carefully and step by step. So the ECB still needs to appear to be in the Bundesbank tradition, at least to appease uh, Germany, because otherwise they would risk that Germany would uh, exit the European Monetary Union. It would be a, a disaster. Uh, 
uh, for, for them, of course. However, there are the slightly, slight, uh, this small differences in uh, their philosophy, and we can all already see this in the actions of the central banks. The US, in the US, uh, interest rates are still close to zero, while the ECB has already raised interest rates from 1% to 1.25%. So also this indicates in, into the direction that the Fed is the bigger bankster. One specific problem of the EMU, European Monetary Union, is of course how to share the loot of the, bank, of the bankster. Uh, and in fact, the EU system, EU system is about to fall apart due to this conflict of how to share the loot. Well, of course, the problem is here that several governments can use the process that I described before. So several gov governments can hire the banks that ECB to finance their deficits. Mm -hmm. they, they try to install a government cartel to, to limit the amount that, uh, that the banks that could be used. This is stability and growth pact that limited. Uh, the, the idea was to limit the deficits to 3% of GDP, so put a strict limit on the use of the bankster. But it, it, at the end it was not enforceable, mainly because <coughs> independent governments judge, judged on themselves and they, they, didn't, uh, they didn't enforce penalties on each other. So that is what I... Uh, what I argue in my book, a tragedy of the commons. There are several users, several governments that may use one bankster or one money producing machine, uh, the ECB, to finance the deficits, uh, which has led to, to these high deficits. So to come to the conclusion, um, the Fed is inherently more inflationary because besides price stability it has also the mandate to uh, provide full employment. Uh, however, also the ECB sets aside the price stability uh, mandate when it comes to saving the political project of the euro. Uh, and this project come, uh, and the pro problems of the euro come about by effectively the problem of how to distribute, dis distribute the loot. Uh, the 3% limit, the 3% distribution hasn't, hasn't worked, so it's about to fall apart. So you have also taken into account that the ECB, ECB's behavior is conditioned by the considerations of the political project of the euro. But there's no difference of class between the two banksters, but just of degree. And the Fed is the slightly bigger bankster. So to sum up all of this in uh, one picture, which often says more than, than words, I end with this. Thank you very much.